We're going to start. First of all, let me say thank you all for coming. It's uh, bringing me very much excitement and thrillingness to see people who took this afternoon to come spend some time hearing about something from a long time ago that not many people know anything about. So I'm hoping to give you some exciting information that you'll take away from this and tell people about because this is a buried treasure. That's what I would call this, and I've, I've tried to unbury it. So um, I want to express special gratitude to a number of individuals, starting with those family members who are here with us today. First and foremost, my wonderful wife, who supported me throughout this project and listened to my stories about Bill Streeter's gift of friendship and about the wonders of email for the past year and more. Then to my son, Stefan, who traveled north from Brooklyn, not only to enjoy an all-you-can-eat Maple Sugar House breakfast tomorrow morning, but also to attend this well-timed event. And then I want to acknowledge two Steves. Ah, oh, Steve, you made it. I was going to have to do one and tell him to tell you. But anyway, two Steves. Uh, my inimitable publisher, Steve Strymer, great friend to many authors and poets. Yes, should be a standing ovation. And his partner, Catherine, who keeps him at least relatively sane. Steve supported this work at every turn, including contacting various sources for the rights to some of the material that felt indispensable. His cover design and meticulous handling of challenging layout requirements have made this book as attractive and readable as it now is. And just this afternoon, he showed me a book that he obtained filled with uh, writing about World War II that contained a remarkable reproduction of something neither of us were satisfied with, Many of you are probably old enough to have heard of Sad Sack, the comic book character. I'm not seeing too many people. But Caitlin Cade, somebody under like 40. Um, but there's a Sad Sack cartoon in the book that describes in cartoon fashion one of the, ma the only major drawback of the email. It's on page 115 if you already have the book in your hands. But it's a, a cartoon that uh, we tried really hard to get clear copy of. We even got the people who were in charge of the rights to send this one, still unsatisfied, and Steve found a book that reproduced it beautifully, and that's why this one came out so well. I can't remember if it's one of the slides in my slideshow I'm going to show you momentarily, but um, this copy is beautiful, and Steve never stops putting out effort for authors. Okay, um, so there's another Steve who is here today. Steve O'Halloran. He brought the project to me along with Steve Strymer when they found out I'd retired and could have time to work on it. And he made it sound irresistible, including gifting me, and I'll never forget all the boxes you brought into my house, <laughs> with all of the materials Bill Streeter had gathered in his efforts to write a book about Gmail himself. Thanks for the project, and I want to express even more appreciation for enabling me to forge a deeply satisfying friendship with the splendid gentleman Bill Streeter. I was hoping that his widow and daughter were going to be here because I wanted to acknowledge them, their loss, Bill died last January, and their deep and abiding love for their truly exceptional husband and father because he was a treasure of a man. Uh, I want to let you know that we have a chance to begin to know Bill Streeter, for those of you who don't know him and never met him, what a man for all four seasons he was. He wanted to write a book to honor the memory of his beloved double cousin, Henry, and in a moment he'll describe why they were double cousins. So I would like to now have you hear from Bill himself. Uh, I asked him to write the preface, and his health was failing, and he said, I will do it, and I will let you film it, and John Riley, who's here filming today, was good enough to film Bill that day in Rockridge uh, uh, Assisted Living Home, and I'd like to share with you part of what Bill did on that day. So, you want to do it up or me? You could, if you're right back there. I, I, it's about 15 minutes long, and we don't have time for me to show you the whole thing, so I'm going to show you two excerpts from it if I can. Ready? Yes. The exciting book is about the World War II female by Tom Wiener. And Tom has very gracefully asked me if I would do a short practice. <laughs> well, I know it's failing and I don't feel up to doing a writing a preface, so I'm going to video it and let that stand and 
Tom can take it and edit it however he want to where you don't want to use any of it, it's okay with me that it's an experiment on both our parts. So I'm going to read it because it's going to be easier for me to read it and we'll go from there. My name is Bill Sturger. I was born October 17, 1930, along with a twin sister, Wilma. It was the start of the Great Depression. Dad wrote in his diary the next day, October 18, 1930, my favorite cow died last night, a set of twins given to us. <laughs> the loss of a farm animal is dramatic in the Great Depression is the birth of a child. I will now introduce my double cousin, Henry Ward Streeter. I say double cousin because his mother and my mother were sisters, and his father and my father were uh, brothers. His mother died soon after birth, and Grandpa and Grandma Well brought him up. Their family next to our farm, so we played with us most of the time. He really was more of an older brother than he was a cousin. My generation was the kid brother of what Tom Brokaw called the Great Generation. We were just too young to go to war in the 1940s, and it was old enough to go to war in 1944, so he was of the Great Generation. The great American illustrator Norman Rockwell documented our history on the covers of our magazine each week. So when the Saturday evening vote came, each week, there where we were. Today I call up the Norman Rockwell generation. We all recall us standing with our pants out, giving our first vaccination in the blood. We remember us, we were the kids setting into the southern mountain with our bundle of clothes about to run away from home with a police officer nearby. The Thanksgiving dinner illustration is one of the greatest. Every little detail tells the story of my generation's history. There was a lot of lesson to learn in the Great Depression. We didn't know we were poor. Mom and Dad didn't tell us. So he goes on to describe, and I'll show you a picture that illustrates it, what it was like being also the youngest, because there was no money for <coughs> clothes. If anybody got clothes, the youngest got the hand-me-downs, and he describes some of the hand-me-downs he got. And then he describes it being like his bar mitzvah, when at the age of 13, he was able to get uh, a special knife that went in special boots that were just for him. It wasn't anything anybody else had worn before him. That's what comes next, and if you had more time, I'd show it to you. I will have one picture that I will show you that illustrates that. But I'd like to move it ahead till towards the end if I can get it there. I'm not totally used to this. And then, no. In my imagination, I see Henry Lyon and Nicole. It was the last great battle of World War II. On April 18th, the dreaded knock came on the door by you, two U.S. military men, telling the family had been killed in action. This is done, doesn't it? Soon, the big mail started to be returned. The big mail We have written in each, marked return to sender. Then the red letters followed, deceased. It is now seven years later, and you ask me if I can still love. Am I still patriotic? And I answer you yes. You ask me, do I still hate? In my imagination, I see Henry lying in the cold spring mud in the mountains of Germany, with the last drop of blood draining from a bullet hole in his chest. If only we could ask him if he still hates, or ask the dead corpse at the concentration camp, do they hate? <clears throat> One thing we know, we must never forget. <laughs> and I thought that was a perfect way to let you know that that's why this book came into existence. Because Bill never forgot his double cousin, never forgot those email letters that he was writing back and forth for those years. That, well, his double cousin was only 19, three weeks before his 19th birthday. So he didn't even go to war to 1944. And he died several weeks before the E-Day in Germany. 
So Bill never forgot him, he never forgot their correspondence, and then I was the incredible benefactor of all of the research that he had created. So, um, yeah, get it ready, please, thank you. I've got the clicker to make it work. Excuse me. He was incredibly supportive of my efforts, including taking me out to the Cummington Historical Society. Bill was like the benefactor of Cummington. He wrote a two-volume history of Cummington. In addition, I call him a Renaissance man. Some, many of you know that he was an outstanding bookbinder, but he also owned Harlow Leather. He did farming. He ran a kitchen during the um, Second World War. Uh, in the aftermath, he was at Nuremberg during the Nuremberg trials, cooking for all the people who were serving uh, to, as guards. So he had an amazingly illustrious career. And he was probably the one of, if not the most humble person I ever met. I uh, got to spend time in the historical society reading and photographing the scrapbook that Henry's stepmother put together after his untimely death. The scrapbook, a loving tribute to Henry, also included some of the V-mail letters that Henry wrote and also the ones that were returned after his death. And um, many other scenes from his life, a number of which are going to be in this slideshow that I will start in a moment. Uh, Bill became my friend through this project, and I was determined to get a finished draft to him before his passing in January of last year. I was unable to attend his memorial service in his beloved Cummington, but I wrote a tribute to him from which I will share a few words. And I, you, Steve read the tribute. This is just a little bit of what I wanted to express about him and to his family. Being able to give Bill a draft of the completed book before his passing was one of the great moments of my life as he expressed his immense gratitude for the work we had accomplished together. The cover of the book will read by Tom Wiener with Bill Streeter, and the book will now be dedicated to both the loving memory of Henry and Bill, who richly deserve to be honored and commemorated together, and I'll show you that in a minute. Bill showed me love, and I loved him back. I will miss him more than words can say. Now to introduce you to the book. I'd like to read a little bit from the introduction where, where I sought to capture what it was like to write this book. And the introduction features many of the pieces of knowledge I acquired about his, his double cousin. World War, World War II has been presented through a variety of media in tremendous detail, from the battles and strategies to the lives of the soldiers and civilians who were so deeply affected around the globe. There have been books and films on a wide range of subjects over the 70 plus years since the war ended. It would seem extremely unlikely at this point for there to be a subject related to the war that has not received sufficient treatment, and yet there is at least one. I'm referring to an essential aspect of the war that since I learned about it, virtually no one I have spoken to is familiar with, V-mail. When I would tell friends and acquaintances about the book I've been working on, <clears throat> I'd hear, email? A book about email? Everyone knows about it. Why waste your time on a book about such a well-known part of our culture? No, I said V-mail. What the heck is that? That the word sounds so much like our widespread email only adds to the misconceptions that surround the phenomenon. To complicate matters, if you do a Google search, leaving out the hyphen, which you can't include in speech, what pops up first is a website that features this definition. A V-mail account is a second email account just for your voicemail messages. <laughs> V-mail, with its hyphen placed appropriately, originally called Victory Mail, and at first written with the Morse code for V as V dot 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 dash mail, was the means by which over a billion letters to and from the United States, and at least a half a billion letters to and from the United States, uh, excuse me, to and from the United Kingdom, where it was known as Airgraph, were sent and received during the war years. Pioneered in England in the 30s, it was a system that employed microfilm and the machinery required to reproduce letters in miniature form so they could be shipped safely, securely, and inexpensively to and from US and British fighting throughout the world. When the microfilm letters, 1,600 on a roll this big, arrived at their destination, they were enlarged and delivered to the recipient so they could be easily read. And I will be sharing with you email letters, and I'll tell you how I got them. Interestingly enough, Bill never got hold of the originals, so I have tons of copies, but I obtained these luckily. 
In this day and age where communication is instantaneous, it is hard to imagine the importance that written correspondence had for those fighting and those at home during World War II. Knowing that one's letters were going to reach their destination faster and more efficiently as a result of air graph and v-mail was a morale booster of major proportions. But it turns out there is a deeper motive for bringing attention to this compelling, though virtually unknown, aspect of our history. Bill Streeter, man of many careers, from farmer to psych psychiatric aide at the state hospital, to businessman, from bookbinder extraordinaire, to teacher of bookbinding, from local historian of his beloved Cummington, to author, has a huge role to play in the effort to get the story told. Bill began work on a book about V-Mail years ago, and here's what he had to say when I interviewed him in preparation for writing the book, which he inspired. The original motive to write this book comes from my cousin, Henry Ward Streeter, having been killed in action in Germany on April 17, 1945. The family had written Henry several V-Mails around April 17th, and they were all returned weeks later. Stamped on the back of each letter, in large red letters, was the word deceased. Hence, it has always been my desire to do a history of World War II female in memory of Henry. So that's why the book exists, and that's some of what the female tried to accomplish. I learned a great deal while embarked on this project. Who knew that microfilm was invented concomitantly with standard film in 1839? Anybody I'd asked was into the 20th century as the invention. Who knew that microfilm documents and letters were attached to the tail feathers of pigeons to break the siege of Paris in 1870 during the Franco-Prussian War? Microfilm was a marvelous invention with a fascinating history, well worth the first chapter of the book. But thanks to Bill Streeter and the internet, there are many illustrations, photographs, as well as V-mail letters that go a long way towards telling this story. I'd like to share some of them with you now to illuminate this mesmerizing saga. And I did start with one of the Norman Rockwell paintings that Bill would have liked to illustrate his part of the book, but Steve and I found out that even at the discounted rate that they were willing to give to us, the Norman Rockwell family was too expensive. So here they are. These are the ones he described, and I'm sure many of you have seen these, but I thought it would be worth putting them forth after his wonderful introduction. <laughs> and here is Bill. He's wearing the boots that I described, and the knife goes right up here. He's eight years old. There's Bill at 86. There's Henry, killed in action. This is from the scrapbook that his mother put together. And there they are on my dedication page, mm -hmm. together again, as they should be. I wasn't kidding. Mm -hmm. This is a piece of microfilm in a little pellicule being attached to the pigeon's tail feathers. The story of how they got the pigeons, how they got them in, airlifted by balloon in and out of out of Paris, out of surrounding areas, so that they could fly into Paris. And they did everything in duplicate. So in case the German, the Prussians, killed the first pigeon, they were so determined to get them in. And they got th thousands of letters and war documents into the city. About 50 years later, maybe 40 years later, the Parisians built a monument to the pigeons. <laughs> so you, you might be able to see them. They're, they're at all the corners of the, yeah, you can see them from here. And the balloon that flew at them out of the, the city. Um, ironically, Germany destroyed this during World War II, melted down all the metal and used them for bullets. One could theorize that that's the way they were going to get some revenge for what the pigeons were able to do. Uh, these these V-mail letters became incredibly important to a lot of people, inclu including the Queen, El Queen Elizabeth's mother. This was in um, 1940, not 40, I guess 40, because England did it first and, and, did, and pioneered the inventions and then handed it over to the Americans when we, when we joined forces with them. But this is her looking at the first reel of V-mail letters on, the, on microfilm. And this is the model of a V-mail letter. 
Maybe you remember the blue airmail letters from back in the 50s, 60s, 70s? They were kind of a takeoff on this. But there were all kinds of rules on the bottom. There were all kinds of rules and regulations for how you had to write the letter, um, what margins you could and couldn't violate, what kind of content it could include, because um, uh, censorship was huge. The, um, originally, at the start of, I think, World War I, there were like five military censors. By the end of World War I, there were like 2,000, and there was as many as 5,000. And I'll show you a picture of them looking at every piece of mail. Oh, and that one is a picture of what they tried to get soldiers to take with them to the front. This was a kit that allowed you to do V-mail that included ink, a pen, and it was all in that cylinder. And so it was transportable. And many of them took this with them so they'd have these writing implements and this methodology. Inside were a roll full of V-mail stationery. They, they made this incredible, uh, soldiers paid nothing for sending the email. Uh, it was like three cents. Uh, and then I think by the end of the war, it was up to like six cents for someone stateside to send it. The stateside people only had three venues, New York, San Francisco, and Chicago. And as you'll see, they did a lot to promote this. But those are the three places you had to send a email letter if you wanted to make sure it was going to get to your soldier. There was incredible efforts on the part of industry to uh, this is from um, Martin Aviation, but there were liquor companies, there were hotel chains that were creating these advertisements. The next best thing to leave is a letter, mm -hmm. and they were promoting not only that you patriotically write letters to boost, boost morale, but you, you do it using email. Because the big thing about email was by getting those 1,600 letters on a reel this big, you saved enormous space for troops and supplies to be shipped to the front. And that's why the second part of the title, How Microfilm V-Mail Helped Win World War II. So these companies all joined forces and made it people's patriotic duty to send the letters. This is another one. Keep your V-Mail flying. And it's another, uh, and there were some incredible artists embarked on this too. These were very imaginative uh, uh, advertisements that tried to hook people to use V-Mail instead of regular letters because of the space saving. Oh, and they, and they also never lost a letter. Uh, Susan, my wife Susan and I were in um, uh, Astoria, uh, Oregon this summer, and they, we went to a museum where they had incredible, um, it was a maritime museum, and they showed a ship that had been wrecked and a huge pile of completely destroyed mail because it got soaked, waterlogged. That never happened. They didn't lose one letter because if anything happened, they had the microfilm copy and they saved it until they knew the letter was delivered so they could send it again. So no piece of mail was ever lost through this method. Uh, here's another one that, how to make a letter hustle overseas. And it's got all the stages of what happens and how it's better than shipping. Down below you see the one that's comparing it to shipping it. Uh, these are illustrations that you can read a lot more easily in the book. They're much more legible than they are on the screen, but that's the idea. Can you send me this kind of letter? So this is the soldier saying, please use V-mail. And it's another aluminum company of America. Ironically, just got uh, tariffs. But that's uh, an example of what was being done by even a, an industry like the aluminum industry. Oh, there's another one of the others. We're not supposed to be there again. Let's see if I can. OK. So here is a um, order to report to the military for Henry. He was drafted, as I said, right near the end of the war because that's when he turned 18. Not close enough to the end. This is the farewell party they had for Henry with his family when he was getting ready to head overseas. <coughs> and this was the announcement of it. A holiday party was held for Private Streeter and 16's friends at his home here. Big news in Cummington when someone went to work. <laughs> and this was an example of one of the email letters that he sent to his family. It was in the scrapbook. That's what it looked like. All kinds of rules and regulations for how to address it at the top. And of course, real clarity of, of uh, writing style so it could be read. Because it was 
the the one downside was that it was shrunk. I mean, you can see it. this is there's a letter in here which I'll pass around when, when I'm done. Um, so you really wanted to make it legible. A lot of people typed because it was easier. To read. And this is the this is what they received, letting them know that he had died. This was from uh, the, the senator, Saltonstein, I think it's what Saltonstein, who sent a letter expressing his regret. Nothing I can say to lessen your sadness, but I know that those who give their lives in this terrible struggle are earning an everlasting gratitude of their fellow men. And he got the Purple Heart posthumously. know about the gold star flags for widow families that have lost a soldier. He was buried in Europe and they even had a picture that it, someone took and sent back to his stepmom and dad of his grave in Europe. Now, that day that I got to go to the Cummington Historical Society, one of the men who was so excited that Bill was there at all, because he was coming out of his, you know, he was, he was struggling with the, the last month or two of his life. He had to have an assistant bring him out there with him on medical system. But the man who was so excited to see him asked Bill if he could take me over across the street to the uh, one of the, the tavern that's like 300, 250 years old. And he, showed, he said, I think there's something about V-mail up in the attic. Mm -hmm. And I went up there, and there was this incredible poster mm -hmm. that's now on, I think it's one of the ones on the back of the book. But I, I love that it was two dads exchanging this uh, excitement about receiving the V-mail letter from the kid next door. So the Smithsonian <clears throat> has a national postal museum. And online was an incredible uh, exhibition of what they had put in the museum a number of years ago when they commemorated V-mail for the first time. And this is a group of people from the 20th V-mail detachment. And they're in Guadalcanal. They were able to set up a V-mail station within 24 hours of landing and taking on an island. And these were people that were doing this hard work. There are the censors. So every letter got checked because nothing should be revealed about position, strength, casualties. They had a whole, there's a whole long list of things that can't be in these letters. And so people took it on themselves to make sure. Most common troop location, if there was too much sensitive text, they would confiscate the letter. Tell the letter writer, yours isn't going to make it. So this is an example of the incredible reason for V-mail. She's holding a reel in her hand in a box. And that's how many letters are running. Wow. <laughs> and here's some of the equipment. This is some of the stuff that was used. This is an, part of the enlarging equipment to get the letter blown back up. It's all done by Kodak and all donated because of the war effort. And they have to train their technicians. When the technicians were drafted, women very often took over the jobs, as they did Rosie the River-esque style. So you'll see there's, there's some women that are doing this work. So the book shows all the steps in the process. And I just put a few of the illustrations. This is a station clerk who's cutting the prints, because they would all print in a long row. And to get the letters, yet that either they had a machine or someone did it by hand. And this is the, each print had to be folded, like, so the address label was visible in the envelope's window. And once they were folded, they had to be put in the envelope. All this was done by hand. They didn't have machines doing that. And uh, there is someone finally getting the letter, which these are similar mm -hmm. to. So here's what happened when they first arrived. They just set up all these tents so they had a place to sleep. But soon after, they were already building the V-mail postal station, including plumbing, because they had to have all the things to blow up mail, all the, the chemicals and the water. And there's, now this is the stations of the V-mail. They already, they, they built them. And here are the people working in them. That was a Quonset hut that they built. I think this was one of the islands in the Pacific. Tom? Yes. Uh, how would the sender know where to send it? The locations were secret. Oh no, they, they were told where the person was, but the person couldn't reveal troop movements and locations that were coming next. 
they would know where their, their soldier was. They, they, they often had to forward it if they left, yeah. but they have an address that the soldier could share. And he had a, he had a return address on the letter, too. Uh -huh. Things would change based on troop movements, but they couldn't reveal where they were. No, they didn't know he's not. But that's how they got to them. And as I said, the letters started in New York, Chicago, and San Francisco, and then they went where they were addressed. So this is, people were, as you would imagine, incredibly creative with all this. This was a newsletter that they put on Vmail, about Vmail, and about all the people that were using it and sending it. There's a story in here, maybe not this one, about someone who decided to tell everybody about um, the, the only way in which you could attach a photograph. Because you know, you would think that, you've heard stories about people whose kids were born while they were in war, and, and many other of those kinds of events that would be uh, made even more meaningful with a photo. Well, the photos would me mess up the equipment. So there had to be a way to do it, and they had a way that they can kind of put a photo stat on the letter itself, take a picture of the picture, and so this, they, they described how you could do that in here. They also, um, Valentine's Day, caused problems because some of the women were putting lipstick in their letters and that would really go up the work. So there would be letters about that. As you'd imagine, there were people trying different things, some of which worked, some of which were not so useful. Uh, here's another, pro oh, this is a great story which I tell in the book. This, this picture came from a newsreel. They had a whole newsreel they made about Vmail, as you would imagine, encouraging people to use it, but also showing how successful it was. And there's actually a minute and 37 second uh, YouTube video that shows this all happening um, based on what was going on in the 1940s. But this person, this is a still photograph from a newsreel. They had newsreels in the movies when you'd go see a film. And um, the reason I put this in because, was because the person, the, the mother of this young man was in the theater watching her son do this female work. And she went to the theater the owner of the theater and said, that's my boy. And the story got passed down and sent through the book. You can, you can read about it. There's another example of the incredible space saving. She's carrying all those letters in those two boxes. So you can see how many troops eventually could be sent over and, and supplies. Here's the man at the front. They captured this. He's writing a email letter. I know this is hard to believe, but given our culture, not totally surprisingly, once the word got out that basketball was a worthwhile endeavor, a number of men from one of the V-mail stations created a V-mail basketball team. I do not know how successful they were, but I love that they did it at all. There it is. A mere handful but having, they said 1,500. I, I, read, I read 16, 1,500, but you get the picture. So there's the cartoon, but not as well done as Steve eventually has found to put in the book. This was that downside, as almost everything always has at least one. There's the sad sack, bumbling victim of all the armies, and reprinted in the 1943-45 compilation of, so it's describing it in here, but if you can follow it, he's got his email letter just delivered, he's super excited, but he's having some difficulty reading it. He asks to borrow someone who's facing the right way using a magnifying glass, <laughs> and he doesn't. So he doesn't get to read the whole letter for reasons you can see. Another thing that happened was people sending the mail found ways to incorporate artwork in the letters. <clears throat> And this one is about someone who's just gotten married, and he's writing to his wife about how much he loved his wife and all different size aspects of his wife to show his admiration <laughs> because he'd been pulled out of the marriage within a week or two, and he was longing to be with her. Here's one. I told you about how they could figure out a way to get the photographs attached. This was a big breakthrough, and there's, there's quite a bit of writing about it in the book, how they were able to incorporate the photos into the letter. I thought that came out incredibly well. Um, this was another advertisement for using it, and sailors trying to tell people, Kodak created, U.S. government adopts email for communication with a man on distant fronts, and that's a dramatic way of showing how it ended up on this reel. 
Here's another one that's telling you, write your email letter. It's patriotic. <laughs> that's a baby that this man had never seen before. And the letter describes it. This was one from England. 1,500 letters on the reel of film to the left. Conserve shipping space. Tells you how much it costs in pence or cents. So this is one. Someone did an mm -hmm. illustration of their mom. I have to say that one of my favorite moments after the first women's march was finding out that my very own son, Stefan, had a poster that he was carrying in Washington, D.C. that said, I'm marching for my mom. Mm -hmm. This is someone who loved their mom enough to picture her in their letter. This is just showing what it all looked like, and someone writing in cursive and putting a ton of writing in that letter. And you saw, you'll see how small they are. Here's another person doing an illustration. And there was a huge backlog, as you would imagine, of mail heading home for the holidays. So people were starting to write these. I think the date on this is October, to make sure it got there in time. This was, how many letters are you going to write me this year? This is a plea for someone to get letters from their person back home. And that's the show. Could, we, could you minimize it, Steve, for me, just so we don't? So what happened to microfilm? One of my friends, Howard Frio, who couldn't be here today, is quoted extensively in the conclusion of the book, telling the story of his experience writing, using microfilm to do research. Mm -hmm. I also want to let you know, and I'm not going to read from them, but I think they're possibly the most moving part of this book. There's a chapter right before the conclusion called The Voices of Email, and it contains people's letters to and from soldiers. We do have someone who has asked, and I'm thrilled and honored that you want to do it, to share some of the email letter, that one letter, an excerpt, which we'll do in a couple minutes from correspondence between John's mom and dad, mm -hmm. all of which arose when he saw the announcement of this event. And I'm really excited to hear that. But um, these are the voices of the email. One of the most, most moving, there's several by, from Henry, from Henry Streeter, from that scrapbook. But one of the most, most moving stories is someone, a sister, desperately, desperately searching for the missing in action brother that she has <coughs> thought could still be alive. And it's exchanges with high, com she goes all the way up the chain of command and, and ends up speaking to, I think it's either MacArthur or someone of his status, to try to see if they would look deeper into what could have happened to her brother. So that chapter is, and, and actually two of the people that contributed to that chapter are here. Kenny Hahn and Steve Trudell, I asked them if they would read these and tell me which ones moved them. And that enabled me to, because I had, I think, and Steve knows this, I had volumes this thick <coughs> from every year, 1941, 42, and I read through them and I picked some, but I sort of lost my objectivity and they restored it for me. So thank you big time for that. The third was John Berkowitz, who was at the original uh, reading of the senior center. So I'm not going to read what Howard had to say, but a lot of you will identify it, because he talks about how microfilm helped him do research on numerous uh, projects, including some of the books he wrote when microfilm was still extant and being used before computers took over. So what I'd like to read to you is what the fantasy was about microfilm. The final word will be about what has happened in the intervening years. Microfilm was supposed to have a most prolific future when the war ended, its V-mail function. For a time, it most certainly dominated the research field in terms of making newspapers, magazines, and periodicals readily available in library settings. And the chapter on microfilm tells how that happened, because actually it was banks that pioneered microfilm so that they could have records of checks, so there'd be less likelihood of forgery, less likelihood of them being stolen, and much, much more ease of storage. But we know this was true about all the newspapers and periodicals that we found in the library. It continued to serve its before the war function in the business world as well, and Kodak was completely committed to its growth post-war. Here is a forecast of the future of microfilm from Microfilm Systems, the first 40 Kodak years that was written in 1968. Pro progress has gone on apace 
and as microfilm attains its 40th anniversary, there is no line of endeavor or undertaking which is at all concerned with records that is not in some way microfilm oriented. So plans were underway for the worlds of microfilm and computers to meet as these further announcements and prognostications would indicate. Anticipating the surge of the second 40 years of microfilming, dating to its first use in banks in 1928, Recordec Corporation, that's affiliated with Kodak, was merged with Eastman Kodak in January of 65 and Recordec headquarters were moved from New York to Rochester. The merged Kodak Recordec organizations ant anticipate a future in which the extraordinary capabilities of the computer will be paired with the equally extraordinary capabilities of microfilming in the specialized areas of documentation, push-button information retrieval, printout, and refilling, all at computer speeds. It looks to the elimination of diverting costly computer time to slow-speed mechanical printout functions in favor of converting computer language on magnetic tape to plain language on microfilm. So they really thought they were going to be working in tandem. And it, would, and it would make things better. Uh, and it says, in favor of converting computer language on magnetic tape to plain language on microfilm at a speed of tens of thousands of characters per second. Mm -hmm. It contemplates a fast acceleration of microfilm applications and acceptance in world markets. And it recognizes that on the 40-year record of its contributions to the efficiency of communications, the advancement of systems technology, records management, education, and the preservation of man's records against disaster, microfilm is indeed here to stay and to flourish. <laughs> Best laid plans of people. Twas not to be, despite these claims and hopes for microfilm contributing to and heading up technological advances. There's one other scene I want to tell you about that sort of ends the book. Have you, some of you have heard of the film Three Kings? That was about the middle, war in the Middle East. The film was released in 1999, before, long before this book project was on my radar. And yet the moment I saw the scene I am about to describe, I knew that warfare communication had arrived at another level entirely from anything like the email that had come before. The scene I refer to features Mark Wahlberg's character, Troy, having been captured taken to a bunker and thrown into a room full of Kuwaiti cell phones. He is a prisoner of war. Yet with any one of those phones, he can live that dream depicted in the commercial to, quote, reach out and touch, unquote, a loved one. He calls his wife back home, who, needless to say, is both thrilled to hear his voice and completely panicked once she is told of his plight. If this situation could get any more bizarre, Right after he tells her to report his location to his local army reserve unit, he is dragged away from the phone to be interrogated by the Iraqi officer in command of the bunker. Of course, his wife has no idea what his fate is to be and is left holding the disconnected phone in both disbelief and utter dread. When I saw this scene, I was overwhelmed with emotion. I felt the anguish of Troy's desperate situation and his decision to call home as his only means of possible succor. Competing with those emotions was my sense of his wife's helplessness, having her husband reach out and being unable to help rescue him or even calm his distressed state. Now when I think about such a moment, which can happen in similar circumstances during what is being viewed by many as America's perpetual wars, and I think about what was involved in writing, sending, and receiving V-mail, my mind reels at the contrast. From instantaneity and the accompanying chaos of war, to having time to reflect, to ponder what one wants or needs to express, to know that your loved one will re not receive your words for up to two weeks and could be someplace completely different from where they were when you wrote the letter, could it be a more different reality? So that's the distance we've traveled. And we could have a big discussion about whether it's all been for the good or otherwise. So right now, I'd like to take just a couple minutes to have John come forward. And right before he does, I just want to tell you about these, but I want us to really listen to John, and then I'll pass these around. So we'll do those right in, after one another. These were um, lent to me by a man some of you may know. His name is Stan Shapiro. He lives in Northampton with his wife, Joan Wiener. No relation. But Joan grew up in Teaneck, New Jersey 
where I grew up. We didn't know each other, and she spells her name wrong. <laughs> but the additional coincidence is these letters were found in Joan's attic. Her mother's still alive. She went and got them, gave them to Stan and Joan. And they're addressed to not just Mr. and Mrs. Wiener, which they are, but Mr. and Mrs. S. Wiener. And my father's name was Saul. So if you believe in anything approximating synchronicity, this is bizarre. <laughs> but they are in here, and I'd like you to make sure that you handle them really gently, because they are 70 plus years old. So, John, if you'd come forth now and give some context and share with us what you wanted to tell us, that would be great. Thank you, John. Hi, I'm John Hage. You know, it's astounding to me how much of this very brief letter uh, reflects pretty much everything Tom has said. Uh, his experience of just uh, living every second to get back home to her, her meaning my mom. <coughs> and they were in New York, and um, uh, some of it, of course, has uh, some amusing aspects to it, uh, but uh, the intensity of it is incredible. And Tom, actually, when I became aware of this project, these things had been in a box for years, and I have to thank Tom. You know, I don't know if I ever would have looked at them because our history together, my father and myself, to share something personal, was, you know, father, son, fraught in some ways. And it would never really, it really completely resolved because unfortunately he died at the age of 59 suddenly. And, uh, and I never really had a chance to resolve a lot of things with him. So they, I think it was a matter of, I didn't want to go there. And they sat in the closet for a long, long time, and then this kind of gave me the opportunity to really go through them. And they're really extraordinary. I mean, it's, uh, I picked one, and at this point he was in the Siegfried line. He was the, with the Third Army, and they'd broken through into the Siegfried line in Germany. And, you know, my mom knew that they were in Germany, because he mentioned that, that passed the censors. But little else did. And um, he wrote this letter 10 days before he was seriously wounded by water fire in Germany. Uh, one of the pieces of shrapnel, I was told, missed his lung by about a sixteenth of an inch. And so the fact that I'm standing here talking to you is probably miraculous. And the fact that the medic even arrived to take a closer look at it when probably, I think there were 350 men who were killed and wounded in that action within one afternoon. So uh, I think the sense of it is that these people, these guys lived with the death. And we as Americans who haven't experienced war in a very long time, we don't, we don't really know what they go through. And one of the things my father taught me was to avoid it like the plague. And uh, to this day, <clears throat> I'm very, very proud of the fact that not only that he was courageous enough to sacrifice everything, not that he had much choice in the matter, most of these guys didn't, but <clears throat> that he taught me to value peace. And so it's from PF PFC Lewis J. Haig, and it's Company L, 417th Infantry, and it would come to a, basically a clearing house, a distribution point, like Tom said, in New York. My, my family was from New York, so it was pretty easy for them. Uh, HPO 76, meaning the 76th Division. Care of Postmaster, New York to New York, and this was a female. February 18, 1945. Dearest Kathleen, Two more pictures arrived from you today. It gives me an idea. <coughs> Excuse me. Why don't you have a couple of professional shots taken in one of the department stores? One of the boys received some, and they are just about <coughs> past the size or smaller than the ones you sent me. They really were excellent. 
Did I tell you that Lee met his brother over here? He hadn't seen him in three years, and it was quite a surprise. They put my name in for sergeant again, and it looks pretty good this time. In fact, it may, it may no sooner come through than I may be in for staff sergeant. Today we were also told that we, would be, that we will be given the combat infantry badge, which will mean $2 more per month. <laughs> I wish things would get straightened out so that I could allot you some more money. My greatest wish, darling, is to be home with you and little Lou. My older brother, he called Little Lou. It is almost unbearable being away from you, honey. I miss so many things about you. Little things that make me live in the past and hope and pray for the future. I think of that St. Patrick's Day parade, the San Suzanne, dinner dates and cocktails, Stanford and dinner on the terrace, polio dining on the roof. I think of your voice, the touch of your hand, your grace, your charm. I dream a million dreams day and night only to have them shattered by reality. Sometimes I wonder if this can be real. I remember when I used to think in terms of years. Now I live in terms of moments fearing sometimes when the ne what the next one will bring. Life has become very precious to me. Each day I have means I am closer to you and little Lou. Pray for that day to come soon, because I miss you more than I can ever say. I love <coughs> you with all my heart and soul. Your loving and ever-devoted Lou. You may have noticed that John has a quite extraordinary voice. <laughs> One of the ways we got to know each other was that John performed scenes from the book, The Things They Carried, that Priscilla Hellwood turned into a terrific <coughs> piece. And then I would read from my other book about Vietnam called to serve. And John's performance with Brand, Band, Brando was more, where I saw, I saw them do it twice and very, very powerful moving portrayals. And that voice gives him away in a way. And I know he's done voiceovers and read the audible books. And so on top of the incredibly rich content and incredibly <coughs> moving uh, letter was hearing it by someone who's gifted in reading things to us. So um, I'd like to pass these around. As I said, I just put one of the beginning of the rows here. And just make sure that they're ready to get it. One of them has a piece of an envelope that came off, so keep that in there. And I also wanted to give a couple minutes for people to, you've been a wonderful audience. I was I'm actually hoping that people have either questions or comments that hearing all this elicited. Anything anybody wants to ask? I'm not saying I'm the only or reigning expert on this, but I have learned a lot about it from the work that I've done, so I'd be happy to answer any questions or hear anything that people want to say about what it was like to hear this. John Riley, John Riley, second time making a film of me presenting and the man who filmed Ben. Happy to do it. Uh, I'm wondering, I know it's probably still too early, but have you gotten any feedback on your book? Have you heard from the Postal Museum well, the National or the Postal Museum, I military or anybody else? The National Postal Museum is talking about having me come down there, do a presentation, and sell the book there. We are waiting to get dates and times for that to happen, but they are interested. The historian of the Postmaster General of the United States, also very interested in chief. Gave, she received the book and is going to share it with the Postmaster General, but I have not heard back. That was probably three, four weeks ago. Other than that, it's really the launch today. Steve and I will talk and see what other possibilities exist, but uh, tell all your friends, obviously. And of course, if you read it and want to write an Amazon review, that would be greatly appreciated. But other than that, it's in its early stages. Yeah? Do you see how there might be 
examples like you're sharing with us of letters that have come back home? Both ways, actually. The, the so ones that written was my ways. question. Going the other way, how, how, how would those letters get? Like, how would you have records of letters being left? People didn't copy them before they sent them out, right? No, but people wrote them, back, you know, they people saved them, them and brought them home. That's, that's this one. That was something that John wrote and they saved it here and people sent right. them in there, brought some of them back. Okay, so fewer, yeah, definitely okay. fewer because you don't carry as much stuff with you. That's right. the things they carry. If you had a really special letter, you'd save it. You wouldn't save all the correspondence by any means. So most of the letters are going to the front. Good question. Anybody else wondering about anything? Or I'm just curious, what do people think of that story? I'd just be interested in the reaction. I mean, some of you may have heard about it before, but I'm guessing news, new material. What was that like to anybody? Well, some of us heard about it from Bill Streeter like 15 years ago. Oh, wow. So that was, that's very cool. So he was, because it started in the early 2000s. That's when he started gathering the material. Yeah. Spent thousands of dollars on eBay. Yeah. I literally, Steve brought, both Steve's carried boxes in of stuff to me. It was incredible. To well, get it's not unlike his unearthing the story of copying presses, mm. which was also a very, like, the only way to copy before photocopying. So if you, some of us saw that parallel. Definitely, definitely. Anyone else? Yes? I was impressed with the letter that was read, the eloquence. And I, have we lost that? Have we, uh, is it the short answer? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's in jeopardy. Yeah. There are people, actually I read in the last week or two, I think it was in a high school, where they're trying to teach the art, the, rapidly disappearing, I won't say lost yet, part of letter writing. Because it's certainly, we have a president who's learned how to compromise on words, but a lot of people are doing <laughs> tweets and, and, and um, emails with, you know, incredibly condensed, and I think we, that's, a, that's a loss. That, that letter, who is it? has mostly due to people's relationship with time, yes. because mm -hmm. people don't take the time, don't think they have the time, well, it's the convergence. We've made technology that makes people who are anxious about time serve, and so many things can be lost from that. You mentioned that the British were the first who had this uh, process. Do you have any information about how it moved here to the United States and how oh, yes. quickly it was adapted? Tempted to say, read the book. There's a whole section on how that happened. It was not, it's not as smooth as you might think. There's, there are a couple of people that feature prominently that made the bridge. That, you know, that people heard about Airgraph in America and said, we need to talk to them. Mm -hmm. and the, but the British were unbelievably generous about it. So there were people that came over, got the word, started doing some samples to show America how it could work. And Roosevelt thought, there's a picture of Roosevelt looking as the first female there. And he, as soon as he endorsed it, it became a going concern. But yeah, it's a, it's a good question. There, there needed to be some cross-pollination because they were really, largely because they were the first in the war. They were, they were fighting two years before us. Really. That's what uh, Darkest Hour depicts and Dunkirk, the films this year. Right. Um, what about World War I? If this was available back in the... Uh, during 1870, 1839, they were using 1940 for pornography. Yeah, <laughs> was my dad was in World War One, and I have a number of actual letters he sent home to his parents, cool. which That's is great wonderful. Yeah. But no sign of female at that time. Had had it been used that early? Or no, no one no saw pigeons. the application. They 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 forgot how it could be put on pigeons. There were planes, and there were there was microfilm. They, the, the dots didn't get connected until the 30s. Of course, we were only in the war a short time, but uh, do you think that Yeah, but other countries, in England, might have been doing it. Yeah, no, it was not yet conceived of. It really, it wasn't used in any kind of commercial way until 1928. So mm -hmm. that war was already, the great war that we felt was the war to end all wars had already happened. And no one saw the applicability. Well, I'm just feeling very emotional about the commitment to uh, maintain the integrity of communication and to honor these letters, I mean, each letter being handled by so many people putting so much energy and commitment into it. And I wonder if you looked at all into the history of that commitment, either in this war or 
historically, because I, I, I can't help but think that right now it, that doesn't happen in the same way. Well, actually, there's a number of wonderful resources that I had and quotes I did about the psychological impact, the way in which the letters were um, not just bolstering morale, but doing incredible connection and, it, and letting attachments uh, be sustained. And when they were your John letters, that would be the opposite, and how you recover from that when you're on the front, and where you seek your solace. There's a whole section on that. And then what you're reminding me of is that I did subtitle each of the letters in the email, the voices of the email section. So I have things like um, losing a comrade in arms via returned emails, sending a Bible and warning about French women and girls, <laughs> and Christmas on a military medical ward in England, a New Year's resolution, an illness, jaundice, and a new address how to communicate with marriage breakup of a soldier friend. So they were incredibly moving. I, like I said, Stephen. And um, can you help me pick these? Because there were so many Convi conditions in France, malnourished children, and seeing them and what it did to people. So, you know, the, the more people could take the time and effort, and of course, they're in a war, so they had to pull out of that to be able to give themselves some psychological distance to communicate what they were going through was a healing process, was a way to begin to deal with it. Like, you can tell people to journal and to, to write things down. So I think. For you to read it, you'd see that there are some great quotes by, I think there's a husband and wife team that looked into this ex post facto, went back and read hundreds of thousands of letters and wrote what role they played, how they um, enabled people to feel a connection, and, and what they did for sustaining morale. But you're saying the military was aware of all this? Oh, yeah. No. The military and industry and ad the advertising that went on, they no, plugged yeah. what caught heartstrings big time to get people to use this method. So I think there was a lot of awareness of that. And, and, uh, the Red Cross did an amazing thing. It's a, there's a picture of it in here where they have all the steps you need to take. And the things you don't tell your loved one on the front. You don't want to tell them about economic downturns that your family might be experiencing. Because they were already unbelievably facing trauma. You don't want to give them things that are going to bring them down. You want to tell them. And he, they'll even say, share good news, tell them about a kid. There's a whole like guidelines well, for how to write a good sense. So yeah, the reason why you're fighting. Exactly. I mean, in, in, <clears throat> and you want that at an emotional level because they fight from the gut. They don't fight from the brain. I mean, and that's that's really the key aspect. And they knew that. And yeah. people knew it. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's good. Anybody else want to share that? Yeah. That makes me wonder how did soldiers communicate with Ken, Vietnam? Thank you. I'm sorry. How did soldiers communicate with Vietnam in the Vietnam War? Letters. There were ordinary letters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because the microfilm had already that's why I was reading that thing where we thought it was gonna be great. And people were still using microfilm, but they decided it didn't get <clears throat> resurrected for this. That's a good question. Why not? I guess they felt they could have sufficient and efficient means with uh, the airmail that they were using. And so it didn't come back. It had its heyday and was gone by, by 46. <clears throat> they, they had thought they could sustain it, but it didn't seem like it was needed as much. They didn't have to economize on space when the war was over, too. Because the bottom line is it was not a simple matter. It, it was complex. And it, just, it needed a lot of technology. All these machines have to be shipped immediately to the fronts so that they could do it. And I think Vietnam was so problematic on so many levels, I'm guessing they never even imagined improving mail. There were so many other greater issues. Um, and I tried to capture a lot of them in the Call to Serve book about what people were facing in terms of um, the immorality of the war, racism. So I have a wide range of people's voices. Right, well, that's what I was book. wondering. Like, was was there a sense of connection? There was not the same, I assume, the same kind of um, collective sense of making them feel Oh, supported. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. So the whole, the, yeah, that would be another thing that wouldn't have been there. You wouldn't have people advertising right. to, to fight and promote the war effort because it was so contentious. Very, very, very different war, as we well know, the lessons of which we still haven't learned. Nor the healing has been completed. Well, the and also the relationship with the military. Because prior to World War II, 
I mean, the military was like, oh, we'll give you money if you need it. I mean, in very much that way. It wasn't a political sort of thing. And I think after that, after World War II, it became the military industrial complex, you know, which Eisenhower warned folks about. And the thing is, is they didn't have to worry about capacity because then that would be just an excuse. Oh, we need more airplanes. We need more of this or that. So the thing is, is the more stuff you're sending, so the issue of, oh, it's taking too much space up so that we can't send, you know, supplies, troops, whatever, that was no longer an issue in Vietnam. So, I mean, there's, there's that part as well. But, but I think there's a, all sorts of different levels as to why the military isn't that interested in promoting the mail, you know. And, and a lot of troops would have said things that they didn't want people hearing. Yeah, exactly. About the things that were going on and the right. things they would be right. forced to do. And, yeah, yeah. A, lot of, a lot of differences. The other issue is maybe there was no supersonic flight to uh -huh. World War II. So just the speed yep. part of it. Not an issue in Vietnam. Not, not an issue at all in Vietnam. Yeah, am I the one that brought up Vietnam? I will do one more push for the book. Not only do I have this other book, but uh, an extraordinary playwright, Peter Snowd, was given the book called to serve as a Christmas present from a dear friend who's in the book, Tom Gardner, lives in Amherst. And Tom said to him, I bet you can't make a play out of this. <laughs> he loves challenges. He chose 10 of the 63 people I interviewed, representing all the choices that the draft necessitated. And he turned it into this play called The Draft that Steve's holding up, which you can buy today. And uh, it was chosen as best ensemble uh, cast for 2015 in Boston. A bunch of performances there and then played in the Valley. Some of you I know saw it at the Academy of Music. So that, another labor of love for me, and, and a chance to tell, us, tell stories that they're all archived now at UMass. All the audio tapes back in the day when you made audio tapes on cassettes, they digitized them and they're all available for scholars now. But it was an effort to tell a story that was going to pass without enough recognition like this one. Well, if that's the end, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thanks for back there and I'll sign any and uh, really appreciate people coming. Have a great rest of the weekend. <laughs>